Attention Canadians, feel disconnected from our current political system? Join the power shift to freedom movement by the Canadian People's Union and be part of a bold vision for Canada's future. It's time to shift the political power to its rightful owners, the Canadian citizens and Indigenous peoples of Canada. Dive into our history, understand the need for change, and embark on the quest for true democracy. Are you concerned about our nation's commitment to human rights and self-governance? The power shift to freedom aligns with vital treaties and international laws, enabling us to claim our rightful place as collective head of state. We advocate replacing our partocracy system with a true democracy to ensure your voice counts more than party interests. When our national collective civil and political rights are respected, your influence on policies will be direct and impactful. Join us on this noble struggle to make every Canadian and Indigenous peoples a meaningful participant in our future. People 15 years old and over can sign the Convention of Consent and unite for our rights in the Constitution. Ready to be part of this transformative movement? Visit the cpu.ca for more details. Embrace the change and shape our future. Welcome to our first ever monthly webinar presented by Assange Defense and Stella Assange's Campaigns. I'm Ileana from Stella Assange's Campaign, and I'll be moderating along with Nathan Fuller from Assange Defense. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Just a little bit about what to expect today. Every month, we will be addressing a specific topic with a panel of experts. We will announce the topic on our social media channels, so you can leave your questions in the comments for them to answer. Then finally, we will end each webinar with an action that we would like you to do. So friendly reminder to check the description below and follow all our platforms. Please, please also give your comments and feedbacks into the live chat, which is on, <laughs> I can't tell, on one side of this screen. Um, I hope you like this panel. Nathan, take it away. Thank you, Ileana. And as Ileana mentioned, I'm the director of the Assange Defense Committee, which is a coalition of American lawyers, academics, activists who are dedicated to the freedom of Julian Assange. Uh, you can find our events and our campaigns and everything at assangedefense.org. So we're now a week and a half out of the public hearing for Julian Assange, uh, where he requested permission, his final request, uh, permission to appeal at the UK High Court. Uh, and the question at the forefront of uh, everyone's minds are what are the next steps? You know, what's going to happen next? And so here to answer that question are some leading experts of international law and investigative journalism, uh, all of whom have spoken and written about the dangers of the overbroad use of the Espionage Act and historical threats to press freedom more generally, uh, and all of whom who have written specifically on the prosecution of Julian Assange as the most important press freedom case of our time. So today, first, we're joined by Kevin Gastola. Kevin is the author of Guilty of Journalism, the political case against Julian Assange from Censored Press and Seven Stories Press. He publishes the Dissenter newsletter at thedissenter.org and has spent the past 10 to 15 years reporting on Assange, WikiLeaks, the war on whistleblowers, press freedom, and government secrecy. And he was one of the few American reporters to cover the court martial against PFC Chelsea Manning, the source of the documents which Assange has been criminalized for publishing. Next, we'll be joined by Marjorie Cohn, professor, professor of Law Emerita at Thomas Jefferson School of Law and past president of the National Lawyers Guild. She is Dean of the People's Academy of International Law and a member of the National Advisory Board of Assange Defense. She is co-host of the nationally broadcast Law and Disorder radio show and writes a regular column at Truthout. And finally, we'll be joined by Stephen Rohde. 
For almost 50 years, Stephen practiced civil rights, civil, liber civil liberties, and intellectual property law. He's a past chair of the ACLU Foundation of Southern California and the author of American Words of Freedom and Freedom of Assembly, as well as articles on civil liberties, constitutional history, and Julian Assange for the Los Angeles Review of Books, the LA Times, and several other publications. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, all the panelists, for um, for joining us. Um, so the first speaker will be Kevin. Do you want to take it away, Kevin? Yeah. Thank you to Assange Defense and uh, Stella for the opportunity, the privilege to be here with these esteemed panelists. And I'll begin by offering a little bit of an overview of what took place with the two-day hearing. Uh, of course, I've had a record or I've, I've spent a lot of time over the last uh, five years covering these proceedings when they happened. Uh, the pandemic offered an opportunity to cover them remotely. And then uh, as Marjorie and myself found out, uh, there was not going to be media access for anybody who was outside of England or Wales. And what we saw with these proceedings, before I get to the core of the issues that we want to deal with today, was shameful. Uh, and I must state that uh, I, I fared better when it came to the court martial against Chelsea Manning and trying to get access to cover those proceedings. Uh, the way that they managed the press showed that they really have contempt for open justice when it comes to allowing journalists to be present. There were complaints from people who were there, and there were also complaints from the union in which Julian Assange is a member in Australia, the Media, Entertainment, Arts, and Alliance, that had asked the court to specifically make sure that people in Australia, which you know they want to be able to cover this because Julian Assange is an Australian citizen, but they were denied. This day one was a long overdue opportunity to force the UK High Court of Justice to grapple with the issues of freedom of the press that have long been the focus of opposition to these charges. And that includes what we've seen from the most reputable groups when it comes to civil liberties or human rights or freedom of the press. Uh, the defense stood before two of the judges and they presented their grounds for appeal. And specifically, I felt like they emphasized the state-sponsored or state-backed criminality that had been exposed as a result of WikiLeaks. And I'm going to leave that for Marjorie because she's got a very good presentation. Uh, but to me, that was what day one was about. It was orienting the judges and focusing their attention on the WikiLeaks disclosures once again. On day two... Uh, the lawyers representing the U.S. government merely rehashed arguments that we had already heard from the government. They also viciously sharpened the narrative of the case by emphasizing the aspect of the indictment that alleges that Assange encouraged Chelsea Manning to, quote, steal, unquote, the documents. They stressed this false idea that Assange, quote, sought to recruit and worked with hackers to conduct malicious computer attacks for the purposes of benefiting WikiLeaks, end quote. And remarkably, Prosecutor Claire Dobbin dismissed every single detail in a Yahoo News report on alleged plans by the CIA to kidnap, poison, or kill Assange. Uh, the government submission to the court stated, and I'm not making this up, I wish I was, that the Yahoo article is not fresh evidence of fact, but simply yet another recitation of opinion by journalists on the matters already before the district judge. But to be clear, this article that we're discussing or mentioning here had over 30 sources from the Trump administration. They were current and former officials. They were also people who had held positions in US intelligence agencies and we're in a position to know whether CIA Director Mike Pompeo and other officials had sketched out plans to target WikiLeaks and to go so far as to plot uh, against Julian Assange in ways that we know the CIA has plotted against 
uh, leaders or individuals that they wanted to eliminate previously or assassinate. And and so it's not far-fetched that this would be reported. And the journalists, to their credit, Michael Isakoff, Zach Dorfman, Sean Naylor, are seasoned national security journalists. These were not people who were sharing their opinions about what they think happened. And just to clarify, because I saw CNN misreport these claims, these did not come from Julian Assange's legal team. In other words, they didn't just come up with this in some back room while they were working on the case. This came specifically from journalists who reported news about what the government allegedly did to target Julian Assange. So I'll now spend some time outlining several key misrepresentations of facts, as well as you know the way they are misrepresenting the charges. And this surfaced in response to Assange's request for an appeal. Some of these are recycled falsehoods. And, and the government insists, you know, we're going to insist today that the government is mischaracterizing the indictment and the allegations. The government insists that it is Assange who is mischaracterizing the prosecution because he is not charged for what they say is mere publication. They maintain that he's being prosecuted for aiding and abetting or conspiring with Chelsea Manning. Now, the problem here is that this depends on a conspiracy theory that has been concocted by the U.S. government. And I, I believe to some degree that if you go back to CIA Director Mike Pompeo, it to some extent originates with him. But just to engage with this theory that they've put forward, essentially, the idea is that WikiLeaks was this operation that was recruiting people in intelligence agencies or the U.S. military to steal documents. Chelsea Manning answered the call, and when she answered the call, they connected allegedly over uh, an encrypted chat client, and they exchanged messages. and. In these conversations, Julian Assange was requesting that she go and steal more documents, more and more documents, was directing her. Uh, they have messages that they claim say, okay, go steal Guantanamo detainee assessment files. And then they believe that that's what leads Chelsea Manning to go grab those files, for example. But in this theory, what they're doing is they're taking the agency away from Chelsea Manning that she had when she chose to become a whistleblower and release these files to WikiLeaks. In her statement during the court martial that I covered extensively, what she stated was the decisions that I made to send documents and information to the WikiLeaks organization and the website were my own decisions. And it's important to recognize that she did not immediately choose to submit the files to WikiLeaks before she was considering the New York Times. She was considering WikiLeaks. To me, if she was some kind of recruit that WikiLeaks had picked up, she would not have considered giving the material to legacy or prestige media organizations that have long been well known to uh, journalism. And so she took a chance uh, because she was going to have to leave the States and return to Baghdad. She took the chance of submitting those documents to WikiLeaks and seeing how they were handled. Now you'll hear during uh, the argument, every so often mention of this most wanted leaks list. And most people would have absolutely no clue to what they are referring, but it's something in which the US government has ascribed importance to bolster this conspiracy theory that they've made up about Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning to further their case. So. To improve the knowledge of the general public, I'll read an excerpt from my book that I wrote that basically lays out what this most wanted leaks list was and then includes a quote from Chelsea Manning's attorney 
about how ridiculous it is that the attorneys for the government would put this in front of the High Court of Justice. On May 14th, 2009, WikiLeaks requested nominations from human rights groups, lawyers, historians, journalists, and activists for documents, as well as databases from around the world that the media organization would work to expose. The list, according to prosecutors, was organized by country and stated that documents or materials nominated, nominated to the list must be likely to have political, diplomatic, ethical, or historical impact on release. WikiLeaks suggested the information should be plausibly obtainable to a well-motivated insider or outsider. With little to no evidence, military prosecutors called the list Manning's Guiding Light, a characterization that Manning's defense attorney, David Coombs, directly challenged during his closing argument. And Coombs said, quote, it was WikiLeaks saying, look, tell us, humanitarians, activists, NGOs, fellow reporters, what do you want to know in your country? What in your country is being hidden from the public that you believe the public should know? Give us a list. We are going to compile that list and we are going to work to obtain that list. What does this sound like? Any journalistic organization that has like a hotline or anything else says, call us. You got a story? Call us. We'll investigate. Now, on the list, Coombs pointed out, there were 78 items. And military prosecutors were only able to remotely tie Manning to four of the things on the list. Uh, she could have sent any of these specific items that were there. She had access to an intelligence network of top secret, secret, and unclassified information, but she didn't. So the idea that she was using this as her guiding light does not add up. Uh, and now, as I begin to wind down my remarks here about the misrepresentation of facts, let's get into the characterization of the WikiLeaks website. The government has frequently made references that uh, explicitly signal that they believe WikiLeaks is, uh, as an organization is a criminal enterprise. And uh, I would like to just go back to, you know, if you pull up archived versions of WikiLeaks, this is what it said on the website when Chelsea Manning would have had the ability to de decide you know, do I or don't I want to submit the material to WikiLeaks? It says WikiLeaks is an uncensorable version of of a, a of of leaks for uh, it, it's a, it's for untraceable mass document leaking and analysis. Principled leaking has changed the course of history for the better. It can alter the course of history in the present. It can lead us to a better future was another thing. And they mentioned Daniel Ellsberg. They made the Pentagon Papers, um, their release and the publication, a central part of their mission and, and what they were trying to do. The power of principled leaking to embarrass government, corporations, and institutions is amply demonstrated through recent history. The public scrutiny of otherwise unaccountable and secretive institutions forces them to consider the ethical implications of their actions. And then WikiLeaks will be the forum for the ethical defection and exposure of unaccountable and abusive power to the people. So this lie that has been said about them seeking to solicit the information for the purposes of, you know, saying we want illegally obtained material, that's not what they were doing and not what they did and, and clearly had a nexus with whistleblowing that the government can't acknowledge, otherwise they would have to junk their entire case. So and I'll just run down quickly a few things that uh, the prosecutor, Claire Dobbins, said on day two before handing this over to our next speaker. Uh, it was mentioned that there was this scheme of stealing classified documents. Again, like I said, uh, they do not solicit illegal, illegally obtained material, or are they in the business of partnering with people to engage in the illegal actions themselves. Nobody has ever been able to produce evidence that that's anything that WikiLeaks was doing behind the scenes. If Manning had been able to crack a hash, then Manning would have been able to log on to computers that did not belong to her. I thought that this was a remarkable thing to say because none of those computers belonged to Manning. They were all U.S. military computers. But the fact of the matter is that she had a security clearance. And they always, I think, make this mistake of 
acting like Chelsea Manning exceeded her authorized access when in fact she was able to access any of these information databases and download and take the information out of her secure facility. That was one of the things that was identified as a security issue in the military. They changed it after WikiLeaks, uh, but she had that access. And in fact, there was a Supreme Court decision recently that suggested that uh, if this was relitigated before the U.S. military, prosecutors might have had trouble actually bringing this uh, computer fraud and abuse charge against Chelsea Manning because she did have access to those materials. And then Dobbin says, and this is a good way to close, an independent grand jury found probable cause to indict Julian. Well, some of you out there might have heard before that uh, an old adage that a grand jury could indict a ham sandwich. It means absolutely nothing to repeat that Julian Assange was indicted by a U.S. grand jury. Pros prosecutors are very good at manipulating grand juries to return criminal charges. So uh, there are other things from those couple of days that could be brought up, and I'll maybe raise them later on in the webinar, but I'd like to turn it over to our other speakers now. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, would you like to go ahead, Marjorie? Yes, thank you so much, Ileana and uh, Stella Assange, also Nathan Fuller and Assange Defense, and I'm delighted to be on the same panel with Kevin and Steve. Julian Assange is charged with 17 counts of alleged violation of the Espionage Act based on obtaining, receiving, possessing, and publishing national defense information. He's accused of recruiting sources and soliciting confidential documents just by maintaining the WikiLeaks website that stated that it accepted these materials. Assange is also charged with one count of conspiracy to commit computer intrusion with intent to facilitate whistleblower Chelsea Manning's acquisition and transmission of classified information related to the national defense of the United States. The basis for the indictment, Assange's lawyers told the two judge panel of the high court on February 20th, is WikiLeaks exposure of criminality on the part of the US government on an unprecedented scale. Assange is charged for revealing war crimes committed by the United States in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Guantanamo Bay. The indictment has nothing to do with Hillary Clinton and the 2016 election or with Swedish allegations of sexual misconduct, which have been dropped. WikiLeaks revealed the Iraq war logs, which were 400,000 field reports, including 15,000 unreported deaths of Iraqi civilians, as well as systematic rape, torture, and murder after U.S. forces handed over detainees to a notorious Iraqi torture squad. The revelations also included the Afghan War Diary, 90,000 reports of more civilian casualties by coalition forces than the U.S. military had reported. In addition, WikiLeaks revealed the Guantanamo files, 779 secret reports with evidence that 150 innocent people had been held at Guantanamo Bay for years and 800 men and boys had been tortured and abused in violation of the Geneva Conventions and the Convention Against Torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. WikiLeaks also revealed the notorious 2007 collateral murder video in which a U.S. Army at Apache attack helicopter targeted and killed 11 unarmed civilians in Baghdad, including two Reuters journalists and a man who came to rescue the wounded. Two children were injured, and that video contains evidence of war crimes prohibited by the Geneva Conventions. And WikiLeaks exposed Cablegate, which were 251,000 confidential U.S. State Department cables that disclosed corruption, diplomatic scandals, and spy affairs 
on an international scale, according to the New York Times. They told the, quote, unvarnished story of how the government makes its biggest decisions, the decisions that cost the country most heavily in lives and money. These were the most important revelations of criminal U.S. state behavior in history, Assange attorney Mark Summers argued to the High Court panel. Julian Assange is asking the UK High Court to review issues of treaty obligations, human rights violations, and political persecution. So let's look at some of these appellate issues that Julian Assange wants the High Court to review. <clears throat> First of all, Article 4 Sub 1 of the extradition treaty between the US and the UK does not allow extradition for political offenses. Espionage is the quintessential political offense, Assange attorney Edward Fitzgerald told the panel. The gravamen and defining legal characteristic of each of the charges is thus an alleged intention to obtain or disclose U.S. state secrets in a manner that was damaging to the security of the U.S. state, which makes them political offenses, Assange's lawyers wrote. The defense claims it was an abuse of process for the United States to pursue extradition of Assange for a political offense. <clears throat> the U.S argued that the UK Extradition Act does not contain an explicit exception for political offenses. <clears throat> but the defense said that the political offense exclusion is an age old prohibition found in virtually every US extradition treaty. It's included in UK treaties with 156 out of 158 countries. Fitzgerald said you can't infer a deliberate intention to forbid extradition for political offenses just from the absence of a explicit language in the Extradition Act. And since the exception for political offenses is not specifically included in the Extradition Act, UK District Judge Vanessa Baratzer didn't fully consider that issue in her ruling after Assange's extradition hearing. And I should say that Baratzer denied extradition, but not based on the political uh, offense issue. Rather, it was based on the likelihood that Assange would commit suicide because of its frail mental health if he were extradited to the United States and held in really egregious, isolated conditions. Article 4, sub 3 of the extradition treaty forbids extradition if the request is politically motivated and not made in good faith. Assange's lawyers wrote that this prosecution is motivated by matters other than the proper and usual pursuit of criminal justice. It is motivated instead by a concerted intent to destroy or inhibit the publisher's of evidence of state criminal ability and thereby put a stop to the process of investigating, prosecuting, and preventing such international crimes in the future. One of the judges on the panel asked the defense for more information on this point. They seemed very interested in it. Attorney Summers argued to the panel that although the WikiLeaks re revelations at issue in the indictment occurred in 2010 to 2011, Assange wasn't indicted until 2018 to 2019. There was a secret indictment during the Trump administration in 2018, and then it became public in 2019. And that was because WikiLeaks revealed CIA spying tools in 2017 known as Vault 7, which enabled the CIA to tap into people's cell phones and smart TVs, turning them into listening devices. Those revelations of the CIA spying program infuriated Trump's CIA director, Mike Pompeo, who denounced WikiLeaks as a hostile non-state intelligence service. That designation would allow the CIA to act without the knowledge of Congress. It was a way to circumvent Congress. U.S. officials drew up plans to kidnap 
and or kill Assange, as Kevin mentioned. The Justice Department expedited the indictment of Assange to facilitate prosecution once he was sent by extraordinary rendition to the United States. Extraordinary rendition involves sending an individual to another country without legal process, usually for purposes of torture. This prosecution only emerged because of that rendition plan, Summers said. In addition, extradition based on political opinion is forbidden. Under the 1985 Supplementary Treaty, the, the judicial branch, the, the courts, have the authority to consider whether an extradition request is motivated by a desire to punish a person for his or her political opinion. Exposing state criminality is a political act slash opinion, Assange's legal team wrote in its renewal skeleton for the appeal. It is, it is acknowledged by courts globally that prosecution for exposing and challenging state level pervasive criminality amounts to persecution for reasons of political opinion, they wrote. Publicly calling out a state for human rights abuses can also constitute an act of political dissent, a political opinion. As his defense team wrote in its closing submissions, Assange's political opinions that led to his indictment included his exposure of crimes against humanity and accountability for such crimes, as well as his belief in political transparency as a means to accomplish democratic accountability and his anti-war, anti-imperialist beliefs. Indicting Assange after WikiLeaks' expose of Vault 7 in 2016, six years after WikiLeaks' 2010-2011 revelations of war crimes, is further evidence that Assange was charged for his political opinions. The collateral murder video is the most important revelation since Abu Ghraib, Summers told the panel. And of course, Abu Ghraib was that notorious prison in Baghdad where US military and CIA forces tortured Iraqis. And when those gruesome photographs were leaked, it became public all over the world. And so Summers says that the collateral murder video is the most important revelation since Abu Ghraib. The cables Assange published disclosed extrajudicial assassinations, that means without uh, any legal process at all, illegal basically, extrajudicial assassinations, rendition, torture, dark prisons, and drone killings. Summers said the Guantanamo files revealed a colossal criminal act. The defense pointed out that WikiLeaks revelations actually saved lives. After WikiLeaks published evidence of Iraqi torture centers established by the United States, the Iraqi government refused President Barack Obama's request to grant immunity to US troops who committed criminal and civil offenses there. As a result, Obama had to withdraw US forces from Iraq. So Julian Assange and WikiLeaks actually did a major service by preventing more killing in Iraq. I'm going to stop there. We're going to have a Q&A period and other issues can come out, um, but thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Marjorie. And finally, we have our last speaker, Stephen. Go ahead, Stephen. Thank you so much. Journalism is not a crime. Uh, we are witnessing one of the most serious frontal attacks on freedom of the press since the Pentagon Papers and indeed in the history of the United States. I'm so grateful to be uh, with you on this panel. Uh, you really have been treated to such excellent uh, analysis uh, so far with Kevin and Marjorie. I'm very grateful uh, to uh, the Assange Defense Committee here in the United States, uh, as well as to Ileana 
And I want to use this moment uh, because it's the first public opportunity I have uh, since seeing Stella Assange speak uh, outside the High Court of Justice uh, during these hearings. Uh, how brave, how courageous. Uh, her remarks uh, will go down as one of the strongest defenses of freedom of the press and freedom of speech uh, in an international context. Uh, this case uh, is that important, and I uh, am delighted that uh, U.S. viewers are getting a chance to uh, uh, appreciate a deep analysis. Uh, I want to say that none of us can fully cover the uh, important issues that are at stake in this case. Uh, please uh, look for the work of uh, Kevin and Marjorie uh, in their respective uh, websites, books, and articles. Uh, I've been privileged to gather my articles at truthdig.org, which has a special page uh, devoted uh, to the Assange case. Uh, this case uh, is nothing less than an example of a government that is going to the ends of the earth outside of its own jurisdiction uh, to prosecute a journalist and publisher for exposing, in this case, U.S. war crimes using a hundred-year-old statute uh, against a person for conduct committed outside of the United States in an unprecedented uh, prosecution, which is unlike anything that has ever uh, been sought in the history of the United States. That is how distinctive we must consider this unprecedented prosecution uh, and why the case is important not only for the law of the United States, uh, but for international law. And there's no better example of why that is so important uh, than the name uh, Evan Gerskovich, the Wall Street Journal reporter that presently resides in prison in Moscow, as far as we know. Can you imagine if Russia had applied to the UK for extradition of Evan Gerskovich to bring him back to Moscow to stand trial on what charges? Espionage. Espionage. The very same charges the U.S. is using uh, against Julian Assange. It would be unthinkable uh, for uh, the U.K. Uh, to extradite this individual, and it is equally as unthinkable to uh, consider extraditing Julian Assange. The struggle for freedom of the press and freedom of speech uh, throughout history has confronted authoritarian governments who have put a label on free speech in order to criminalize it and to punish uh, outsiders, dissenters, and critics of those governments. We can go back in history to uh, punishing heresy and blasphemy, uh, punishing sedition, the very notion of libeling the government. In the United States, we had a dark period of punishing communists for their uh, expressed beliefs. And now we come down to punishing uh, espionage. Uh, it is a mere label that governments use uh, to punish free speech and free expression. Now, the hearings that were held in the High Court of Justice simply perpetuate the degree to which the United States government is seeking uh, to punish Julian Assange for having exposed U.S. wrongdoing. Uh, we believed this throughout this prosecution, but the uh, testimony, and, it, and in some cases it felt like testimony coming from the British uh, lawyers who represented uh, the United States, 
uh, pro most prominently Claire Dobbin. Uh, her remarks in oral argument uh, took on the force of testimony as if she had some kind of personal knowledge or information to shore up her opinions. She also used a tactic uh, that uh, we should become more familiar with, uh, and that is putting a criminal label on conduct which is otherwise entirely legal. In this case, she put criminal labels on what journalists, uh, investigative journalists in particular, do every day. One of her statements was to accuse Julian Assange of his complicity going beyond receipt. It's the encouragement and incitement to steal the material uh, that puts Julian at the end of the spectrum of gravity, her language. So what she's doing, and the record now, the record before the uh, administrative judge, Barrister, uh, is ample. Uh, the testimony of leading journalists, uh, of leading First Amendment authorities, investigative journalists encourage their sources to come forward. They solicit information from sources. They obtain that information and then they analyze it and they publish it. Uh, you could say they conspire in a colloquial sense, but not in any criminal sense. And what is so dangerous about the most recent arguments uh, is the attempt to put scary labels like incitement and stealing of documents on the conduct that investigative journalists engage in every day. And that's why this poses such a threat, because if this uh, nomenclature is adopted by the high court, if extradition is granted and Julian Assange is forced to stand trial in Alexandria, Virginia, there is no limit to the journalists that can be prosecuted under this very same theory, whether it's journalists being prosecuted under the Espionage Act of 1917 or journalists in any other country around the world, as we have seen. A Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Barton Gelman, who led the Washington Post's reporting on the Edward Snowden documents, has said, and it's as if it were a, a confession in advance of his own conduct that Assange is charged with asking for information, with receiving information, and with publishing information. And I don't mind saying that these are exactly the things that I do. Uh, Gelman uh, has said that if asking questions and protecting a source are cast as circumstantial evidence of guilt, we'll be crossing a dangerous line. Now, uh, Prosecutor Dobbin would not uh, allow uh, treating Chelsea Manning as a whistleblower because she responded to a solicitation and gave bulk data sets. Uh, she says it was unrealistic to submit that she gave any thought to specific disclosures when she uh, that she wanted to raise. This is Dobbin mischaracterizing the motivation of Chelsea Manning. Uh, I'll say here that I'm concerned about the procedure we are examining. I'm concerned whether these two uh, British judges will pay uh, unnecessary reliance and defer and defer 
uh, to these uh, British advocates for the United States, because any serious examination of the record, any serious examination of the evidence uh, would lead to the denial of extradition. Uh, I'm in the midst of giving you one example because Chelsea Manning's motives are a matter of public record. We don't need Ms. Uh, Dobbin to speculate over Chelsea Manning's motives. Chelsea Manning said, quote, I hope that the public would be alarmed as me about the conduct of the aerial weapons team crew members. And she went on to give other specifics. Those are the facts in the record, not the speculation of a lawyer uh, speaking for the United States government. Now, I want to touch on a point that my, my colleagues uh, uh, referred to in passing, uh, which needs emphasis. To be extradited, uh, Julian Assange and the charges against him must satisfy the dual criminality uh, requirement. What he is charged with must also be a crime in the UK. And uh, Judge Johnson questioned Dobbin and said, if in this country a journalist had information of very serious wrongdoing by an intelligence agency, and incited an employee to provide that information, and it was provided and published carefully, would a prosecution be compatible with Article 10, which is the European Convention on Human Rights Protection for Freedom of Speech? And Dobbin couldn't answer the question. She waffled. She said, I'm not sure that it would give way to a straight forward answer. And then she went back to her legal argument that there is no public interest defense, which I think Marjorie has clearly demolished. In terms of Dobbin, the court went on to ask, would Assange be afforded First Amendment protection if sent to be tried in the United States? And that judge fortunately knew the record well enough to say that U.S. Attorney Kronberg at the uh, extradition hearings said he wouldn't, which would conflict with section uh, of the U.K. Extradition Act. And again, Dobbin waffled and dissembled. We are not in any position to assess whether this is established as a matter of case law. And uh, she referred to a possible argument. She is, is luring this court to grant extradition without confirming that he would have his full First Amendment defense in the United States. And it is a serious risk because U.S. authorities, including Mike Pompeo and lawyers at the Department of Justice, have denied that he has a First Amendment defense. They want to use the, ex the uh, Espionage Act in an extraterritorial way to reach an Australian citizen now sitting in England, but they don't want to promise to afford him the same protections of the U.S. Constitution and the First Amendment. I want to touch on two final points so we can uh, get to our discussion and questions, uh, and that is the computer hacking charge under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Now, my colleagues have already touched on this, but I want to uh, alert listeners that I have some concern that the judges in the UK will let the tail wag the dog, that they may latch on to this one count of computer fraud and abuse uh, and grant extradition, whatever position they take on the rest of the charges. This would be a huge mistake based on the record, uh, which Kevin and others have, have discussed. 
uh, because that charge is entirely false and undermined by the fact, by the testimony uh, at her uh, a a court martial of, of Chelsea Manning and of other information. I am worried that they are going to treat uh, Assange not as a journalist and therefore uh, will uh, use this as a hook to extradite him. Finally, uh, I want to mention the European Court of Human Rights. It's important that our audience understand uh, that if the British courts now in the High Court deny uh, the appeal and they order Julian Assange's extradition, the activism that all of us have been trained to exercise will be on high alert. The European Court of Human Rights has ample grounds to consider Julian Assange's case. Uh, Marjorie has identified the various provisions, Article 10 regarding freedom of speech, Article 5 regarding arbitrary detention, Article 7, which needs to get far more attention, which is you have a right not to be prosecuted for acts which were did not constitute an offense at the time of the conduct. It is only now in this unprecedented prosecution that the routine activities of journalists is being treated as criminal retroactive to the time of Julian Assange's conduct. So that article deserves European Court of Human Rights attention, as well as a fair trial and articles two and three regarding the right to be free from torture or inhumane and degrading treatment. Now, Immediately, if there is an order of extradition, Julian's lawyers are prepared to go to the European Court of Human Rights. They will proceed first under Article 39, which provides for provisional remedies, including a stay of the underlying order of extradition in this case. They will a need to prove, and I believe they can prove, uh, exceptional circumstances and the imminent risk of irreparable harm. My greatest fear today is that the UK and the United States will cooperate in putting Julian Assange on an airplane and whisking him to Alexandria, Virginia, before the European Court of human rights can hear, determine, and issue a stay of the extradition order. This has happened in the past. There are awful examples of attempts to whisk people out of the UK for this purpose. On the other hand, previous stays of extradition to the United States have been granted on the basis of the health of the person charged. That's been done in 1997, 2001, 2004, 2009, and 2013. Uh, I think it would be an example of international outrage if the UK and the United States conspire in whisking Julian Assange away from UK jurisdiction and European jurisdiction uh, to take him to the United States. But all of us are going to have to be alert uh, to that possibility. And the kinds of protests we saw outside of the high court will have to be launched, whether it's midnight or 3 a.m. or a high noon. And we'll have to be protesting here in the United States and demand uh, that the right to appeal to the European Court of Human Rights is protected and exercised. That's what's at stake in this case. And that's why it's so important for each one of you watching this webinar
to understand the gravity of these issues and to take action in each of your homes and communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. I'd like to open it up now to all the panelists to respond to any remarks, if you have any responses. I'd like to respond to uh, the last point. I think it was, if not the last point, then almost the last point that Steve made about um, even if Julian, if Julian Assange loses his right to appeal in the high court and then uh, files a petition in the European Court of Human Rights, um, before the, the European Court has an opportunity to consider it, or even if they do, that there is a danger that um, the UK may extradite him anyway to the United States. And that's a real fear. I think that's a valid fear. Um, but there is another possibility as well. And that is that Joe Biden has Julian Assange exactly where he wants him, which is in prison. Um, and does Joe Biden really want Julian Assange brought to the United States before the election, knowing that there's a tremendous movement in support of Julian Assange? Um, it would be a headache for him. He's got a lot of headaches, including his aiding and abetting of genocide, which is going to lose him a tremendous number of votes. Um, so I don't know what would happen. And the um, people thought that this hearing, this two day hearing on February 20th and 21st um, could result very quickly in his extradition. But the judges apparently, and as Kevin said, he and I were denied remote access because we didn't live in England or Wales. Um, but from the reports that I've read, um, it appears that the two judges were not totally on top of the facts of this case, had apparently not prejudged the case, had a number of questions and concerns, not the least of which was that the U.S. refused to give assurances that Julian Assange wouldn't face additional charges that could get him the death penalty if he's extradited to the U.S. The U.K. doesn't have the death penalty, and it is forbidden to extradite somebody to a country that does if, uh, if he may be charged with the death penalty. But um, there were concerns that the judges expressed and people who were inside the courtroom said this was a very different hearing than other ones in the past. And they gave the two parties, the prosecution and the defense, until March the 4th to present additional written submissions on questions that the judges had flagged. Um, and then, of course, they would have to consider that and write an opinion. So it may be that he is extradited uh, quickly. It may be that he uh, continues to sit in prison um, the, the way he has for the last almost five years. Time will tell. Thank, thank you for those comments, Marjorie, because the political backdrop right now is important to understand why we need to stop this Assange case. It's not occurring in a vacuum. Sadly, uh, the Biden Justice Department just indicted a journalist named Timothy Burke for scouring the internet. And uh, there, it's not in the national security context. The Economic Crimes Division pursued the case. But here again, we have the Justice Department determining who is and is not a journalist. And then when they make that determination, they give themselves the permission to pursue charges against that individual. We saw tremendous zealousness on the part of prosecutors in sentencing Charles Littlejohn, an IRS whistleblower who disclosed Trump's tax returns to the New York Times. And while he should have been given a sentence that was more akin to maybe six months to a year, like other people who had disclosed private tax information before in the past, the prosecutors actually told the court and, and the judge who was extremely hostile to look to Espionage Act cases and how people had been sentenced in those prosecutions. He ended up with five years uh, as a prison sentence. So this is under Joe Biden, and it could only get worse if President Trump is elected. But the point needs to be hammered home that Joe Biden isn't making it any better through his administration. When Marjorie spoke about the state criminality, one aspect that came up by the defense that was really good, Assange's legal team, I'm glad that they made this point, was to take people back to the politics of that moment 
when Mike Pompeo and others and, and Donald Trump himself were targeting the International Criminal Court because of the fact that they were willing to launch an investigation into war crimes in Afghanistan. And as part of it, they would not only examine the Taliban, they would not only look at Afghan security forces, but they would also be willing to scrutinize the actions of U.S. military forces. And because the U.S. government refuses to allow soldiers to be held accountable and to be prosecuted in, in any country or jurisdiction um, outside of the U.S. military putting them on trial, which is a rarity, an extraordinary rarity, um, they sanctioned, they issued sanctions against anybody on the International Criminal Court that would dare to investigate. And we actually saw that that had an impact because they pulled back. Um, and then eventually, uh, because of that, there was an appeal that uh, reversed the way in which they had handled the investigation at the International Criminal Court. I'll conclude by highlighting something that hasn't come up yet, but it would be an oversight if we didn't touch upon it. I spoke about how they emphasized the, the prosecutors or the lawyers representing the U.S. government, this idea of stealing information. But it should also be mentioned that there was a lot of emphasis put on Julian Assange revealing informants' names during these proceedings, and that they seemed to think that this might be a way of salvaging uh, these Espionage Act charges that are so clearly an attack on freedom of expression. What needs to be recognized, however, is uh, that is not what Julian is, is charged with. The Espionage Act is not for prosecuting someone because they expose the identities of informants. There is a law for that. It's called the Intelligence Identities Protection Act. It was passed after Philip Agee um, explicitly published the names of informants and was trying to out them. Now, one thing you might recognize if you look at the Intelligence Identities Protection Act is it was passed to target people who were in government and had authorized access to information. Julian Assange can't be said to be one of those individuals. Now, there is a section of this law that I don't think has been tested that says if a person has engaged in a pattern of activity intended to out uh, these people, the, these informants, these undercover intelligence officers, they might be able to be prosecuted. So, for example, I'll use myself. If this was the way that I conducted my journalism and it was just to out people in the CIA, I might be vulnerable to prosecution. But let's go back to Julian Assange. When you look at the reasons for publishing the Afghan war logs, the Iraq war logs, the U.S. state embassy cables, the Guantanamo files, He's not publishing them to reveal these sources at all. So I don't see how you can argue that he is putting these informants or these confidential human sources, these human rights activists, these other vulnerable. I don't see it in the evidence. That being said, they've gone before that high court confident and they believe that that could help them win. And I'll just close that there's a very good post from Reporters uh, uh, Committee on Freedom of the Press that caught this, what was happening, and called it troubling, um, that they're emphasizing that this case is really just about Assange and WikiLeaks publishing the unredacted identities of sources who had provided information to the United States. Uh, and the reporter's committee makes it clear that the failure to redact informants' names may serve to distinguish the Assange case as a practical and ethical matter. Oh, by the way, there's a ton of facts we don't have time to get into about what happened with the information, but let's just at face value accept that people were exposed. The Espionage Act, as the Reporters Committee says, does not turn on the relative harm or the public interest in the disclosure of the information. Rather, it simply speaks of tangible material. So think of code books, photographs, blueprints, maps, or information that relates to the national defense, which courts have routinely held refers to information that is potentially damaging to national security if disclosed and that the government has endeavored to keep secret. Put in plain terms, the Espionage Act does not draw the line that the government suggests it does. So again, I go back to the point that he's charged with violating the Espionage Act. It's not just about people who were exposed that were working for the U.S. government. It's about the publication of information. The whole entire narrative of the case, although the government is in denial, 
is about criminalizing Assange for exposing all of these materials that were in the public interest. Let me just add uh, two comments. I want to reinforce what uh, Marjorie had to say by uh, describing a colloquy uh, in these arguments. Uh, Judge Johnson asked uh, Ms. Dobbin, if the appellant is extradited, <clears throat> is there anything to prevent the charge of aiding and abetting treason from being charged? And this was one time she gave a very direct answer, no. Uh, so if there is nothing to prevent it, do you accept that the sentence could be the death penalty? And counsel said, yes. Judge Johnson said, could there be any assurance to protect against that? He's almost uh, feeding her a, a uh, lifeline. And counsel said, why should the prosecutors give an assurance when there's no real prospect it would happen? But later, the same lawyer for the U.S. said it would be difficult to offer assurances to prevent the death penalty from being imposed. Uh, th this could be a linchpin. This could be the arrogance uh, of the U.S. government and their attorneys. Uh, I'm hopeful uh, would provide a, a death knell for this uh, extradition. Finally, uh, there was no evidence uh, that anyone was killed or harmed by uh, these revelations. That was conclusively established at Chelsea Manning's uh, court-martial. Uh, but journalists are often accused of posing a risk to sources uh, and third parties. That was exactly what uh, Nixon's lawyers argued uh, to punish the Pentagon Papers. Uh, that the publication of the Pentagon Papers would pose a risk uh, to sources and to foreign relations. This is what governments do all the time, uh, is to raise uh, empty speculations that these revelations will pose a threat. They want to scare these judges. Uh, they want to intimidate the judges not to put their signatures to an order uh, denying extradition in this case. I think that's what's at stake, at stake uh, and I uh, hope that people will uh, pay attention to those issues. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, ev um, everyone. So let's uh, move on to some audience questions. We um, posted a promo of this webinar a few days ago, right after the the, the public hearing. Um, and we got some, we got quite a lot of questions, but we've narrowed it down to three. Um, we'll begin with um, Kevin. Um, so this question is about international support. In 2023, there seemed to be an upswell in international support. President of Brazil, Lula da Silva, spoke out at the UN General Assembly, and most recently, the South Australian State Parliament passed a motion in support of Julian Assange being returned home. How big of an impact does the international pressure to free Assange have on American political landscape, Kevin? Yeah, thank you for that question. I'll answer it as an idealist, I'll answer it at, in a realistic sense. Uh, the realistic sense is that thus far, this international pressure has been entirely ignored by the Biden administration, and that's disappointing. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be pressuring. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be organizing in the same reason that there needs to be organizing for a ceasefire in Gaza. There has to be activism around stopping this case for the reasons that have been identified so clearly by all of us tonight. But uh, the idealistic part of me says that this pressure is the only way that we are going to get 
the Justice Department to back down and drop the charges. And so this international pressure is essential. And I would say that in the nearly five years that we have been engaged in the issues that have been brought to the forefront by this indictment, we haven't seen anything as incredible as the Australian government being willing to stand up for Julian Assange and state clearly to the U.S. government, drop the charges. We do not care what you say Julian Assange did. We want him returned home. He is an Australian citizen and should be able to move on from this and resume his life free from prison. And that is that is a very strong message coming from a country that is part of the five eyes. We all know what that is now, thanks to NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden. But this this is a country that has access to U.S. intelligence, that is a partner, that is a U.S. military partner, that is dependent for U.S. military operations in the Asia Pacific region. And, and yet they're willing to be a thorn in the side of Joe Biden and say, return Julian Assange to Australia. I don't know what else could possibly play a more instrumental role than Australia actually saying to the United States government that they do not support the claims that are being made against Julian Assange. And so then from there on, what do we do? I think we have to take this international pressure that we're seeing, it's building up. We're seeing people, Germany just signed on to a letter. There were parliamentarians. We've seen within parts of Europe that they have made this an issue. I've always been taken aback by how the parliaments in several of these European countries are engaged with this. When I got to cover the proceedings and I was there in person for one hearing in February, there were individuals from European governments that had traveled to follow the extradition proceedings because they understood the issues that were at stake. That does not happen with staffers of U.S. members of Congress. They, for the most part, have chosen to remain ignorant or not follow this closely. There is a resolution in the House that some Assange defense people, some Assange su supporters, I think, have been trying to get people to sign on to. It just clearly states that if you believe in the First Amendment, which supports pr freedom of the press or protects it, then you should follow through and ask the Justice Department or demand that the Justice Department drop charges against Julian Assange. And only like 12, 13, maybe 14 Congress people at this moment have bothered to put their name on it out of 435 Congress members. So this is the next place that you can go. That is a place that people can turn to to try and mobilize more pressure against uh, the Biden White House. But I have no doubt in my mind that if this gets to the point which we don't want to see that Julian Assange is brought here and put on trial in the United States, that not only will international pressure play an important role in maybe getting the Justice Department to back down, but it will also play a role in convincing the population here in the U.S. that they need to stand up, that there need to be bigger demonstrations, and that there needs to be 20, you know, this kind of like around-the-clock activism that you've seen around Gaza, well, we're going to need to see people going to all these events, all these events where these speakers come to, these U.S. officials, these people who themselves were, I don't hate to say the word victims because I don't think they were victims, but the people who survived WikiLeaks and were exposed and we got to see who they were in these documents, these people who take offense to WikiLeaks, you're going to need to see them disrupted and challenged at these speaking events for being willing to allow this prosecution to continue. I'll just note that a resolution that Kevin mentioned is HR 934, and Ileana and I will talk a little bit more about that at the end of this webinar. Um, but our next audience question is for Stephen Rohde. It's a, a question, I guess, of kind of jurisdiction, and it's just how is it possible that uh, so Assange has been in a London prison for nearly five years now. How is it that the UK can hold a non-British citizen uh, 
in the high security, it's a maximum security prison, uh, Bell Marsh prison, uh, for so long? How is it that they can hold, uh, a, you know, if without any conviction, how is it that the UK can hold him? Well, I do consider that a, a question of jurisdiction. I also think it, it reveals the questioner's sense of human decency and an understanding of human rights. It was during these appellate arguments that Claire Dobbin invoked the special relationship between the United States uh, and the United Kingdom. Uh, she was uh, pandering to the judges uh, to give the United States uh, a free pass here. You know, many times we see authoritarian governments act with, with a velvet glove. Uh, they, they try to hide uh, their power, but this is a brutal uh, example of power being exercised. Uh, Julian Assange was uh, uh, seeking haven and um, uh, asylum at the Ecuadorian embassy, but that government changed. Uh, we believe pressure was put on the new Ecuadorian government and he was expelled out onto the steps and was as soon uh, thereafter uh, arrested by the UK and London police. Uh, the uh, theory for uh, to answer the question is bail violations uh, that uh, Julian was uh, accused of. The truth is he's been in jail now uh, approaching five years in this uh, horrendous Belmarsh prison. Any bail violation uh, would have been satisfied and lifted uh, years ago. Uh, he's being held there because of that special relationship between the UK and the US. He's being kept there so that even before these charges can go to trial, he's being punished. Uh, his health is at risk. He was unable to attend or even uh, listen to these proceedings, which were so important to his life. Um, the one thing uh, Judge Barrister found was that there was a risk of uh, suicide and to his health if he were extradited to the United States government. These two governments are already extracting their punishment uh, against Julian Assange by this unlimited uh, incarceration. Uh, they are getting their pound of flesh even without him standing trial uh, on these charges. I think it stands by itself as a human rights violation, uh, even if the freedom uh, of the press uh, issues were not equally uh, important. Uh, so tragically, uh, that is the answer to this question. They are doing it because they can. Uh, they are doing it in the face of international protest. Uh, and uh, it is all the more reason we need to organize uh, around the free Assange campaign. This kind of leads us to the final question from Marjorie, which is about accountability. Um, basically, how are the war crimes that Julian exposed not being followed up on? And what would be the mechanism to get them put forth? Yes, thank you for that question, Eliana. That's a very good question. Um, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange have exposed evidence of clear U.S war crimes, crimes against humanity, and yet nobody has been brought to justice for that. In fact, we know that there was a uh, widespread program of torture um, during the Bush administration, and nobody has been prosecuted under the War Crimes Act or the torture statute, two federal statutes in the United States. Now, um, Kevin mentioned the International Criminal Court, and certainly U.S. officials and leaders, individuals um, could be investigated and prosecuted for war crimes, for crimes against humanity in the International Criminal Court. The problem is, as Kevin mentioned, um, there was pressure applied on the, criminal, on, on the International Criminal Court by the U.S. government, um, causing the present prosecutor, Kareem Khan, to drop the investigation against U.S. leaders for war crimes in Afghanistan. Now it's just Taliban uh, leaders, basically Afghan leaders, who are, are subject to that investigation. Um, the U.S. has threatened 
uh, the, the members of the court, um, the prosecutor, the staff of the court, and during the Trump administration imposed sanctions on the court. Um, and when the, uh, although Bill Clinton, as he left office, signed the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court, um, he advised George W. Bush, the incoming president, uh, not to send the Rome Statute to the Senate for advice and consent to ratification. <clears throat> well, not only did Bush refrain from sending the Rome Statute to the Senate for advice and consent to ratification in an unprecedented move, um, the Bush administration removed the U.S. signature from the Rome Statute and uh, blackmailed 100 developing countries uh, into by by threatening to withhold their foreign aid, threatened that if they sent any U.S. nationals to The Hague in the Netherlands to the International Criminal Court, um, that they would lose foreign aid. And then Congress passed the American Servicemen's Protection Act saying that if any U.S. national was brought to The Hague for prosecution by the International Criminal Court, that the U.S. could send its troops in there and take them out by military force. So the U.S. has done nothing but uh, try to uh, really neuter that court. Um, and they've done a pretty good job of it so far. So that leaves us with the other option, which is prosecution of these US officials for war crimes, et cetera, um, by different countries under the very well-established doctrine of universal jurisdiction. Universal jurisdiction uh, was used by Israel to try convict and execute Adolf Eichmann, the uh, architect of the Holocaust, for his crimes, even though they were not directly connected with Israel at the time. Um, the U.S. has used uh, universal jurisdiction, and, and the theory is that some crimes are so atrocious, they're crimes against all of humanity, and any country can punish them, even if they have no direct relationship with those crimes. And so <clears throat> we have that possibility. The problem is, once again, the U.S. government um, pressuring countries not to do that. During the Bush administration, um, the uh, <clears throat> uh, Belgium was considering prosecuting Don, uh, Donald Rumsfeld for uh, war crimes for torture. And the U.S. government threatened Belgium, saying, if you don't end that investigation of Donald Rumsfeld, we are going to arrange to pull the headquarters of NATO out of Brussels. Uh, and so then, uh, then uh, Belgium backed down. And during the Obama administration, uh, the torture lawyers, John Yu, Jay Bybee, were being investigated by Spain for war crimes. Torture is a war crime. And the Obama administration, through apparently back channels, got them to back down, um, and, uh, and that, that never went anywhere. But then we have the United Nations, and we have the Security Council, which is base, has basically been um, been totally paralyzed by the U.S. veto. The U.S. has now vetoed its fourth resolution calling for a ceasefire as, as you know, unbelievable numbers of people in Gaza, uh, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people in Gaza are, are being slaughtered. Um, and so then that leaves the General Assembly. The General Assembly is the democratic arm of the United Nations. All 193 countries have one vote. And they could, um, you, they could convene under the Uniting for Peace resolution and take action that the Security Council refuses to take, but which is to, for example, refer uh, some of these U.S. officials uh, to the International Criminal Court for, uh, for war crimes. I think that's highly unlikely. So I think that the best bet is universal jurisdiction, but um, we have to do a better job, we meaning the international movement in support of Julian Assange has to really get that information out because a lot of people have heard of Julian Assange and they don't really understand that the reason that he's been indicted was for revealing evidence of U.S. war crimes. And so we need to, to really spread that word um, or there will be never be any accountability. Thank you so much, Marjorie. Thank you everyone for... Oops, sorry. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining our very first, our first ever webinar um, presented by Assange Defense and the Stella Assange campaign. Um, thank you 
you three amazing panelists. I've learned so much personally, um, even though I work with Stella, <laughs> I still learned a lot today. So thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you everyone for watching. We really appreciate all your support, your tireless support, your amazing suggestions, your initiative. It's so, it's so appreciated. Um, we will be tackling different topics every month. So please leave your suggestions for what you want us to cover in the comments below and also on our Instagram account. Well, I, I just want to thank um, Assange Defense and Stella Assange campaigns for uh, for holding these monthly webinars. I am honored to be part of the first one. And I want to thank Steve and Kevin for your tremendous work in support of Julian Assange and also for being such great co-panelists. So thanks so much. Uh, I'll go ahead and end with some pleasantries as well. It's been uh, an honor to be able to talk with everyone here. I, I never got a chance to thank Stephen for his review of my book, Guilty of Journalism. So I'm going to take advantage of this webinar or this, this conversation here to, to do that. And then Marjorie, you know, you've done fantastic work as well covering this and and it's good that you're putting this together it's important to have these monthly conversations so uh, i'll help assange defense and say that if you're watching this don't just watch and walk away make sure that you share it with someone at the end of it so that more people can become in tune i happen to guess that if you're watching this, you've already learned a few things about Assange in the past. So what we need to do is find a way to introduce the Assange case and the issues that are at stake to people who uh, don't have this knowledge and don't be afraid because if they don't have this knowledge, they haven't been exposed to the lies and the misinformation that have been spread rampantly by the US government. So it'll be a little bit easier for you to get people to engage. So take a moment and share this video with some people that you believe haven't learned or don't know anything about Assange at the moment. I too want to thank everybody uh, on this screen who helped organize this program and my wonderful colleagues, uh, Marjorie and Kevin. Uh, great things can happen when uh, people unite uh, and respond. Uh, we have seen that time and again. I believe that the Assange case uh, is an example uh, of one of the most important uh, efforts to defend freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and freedom of the press uh, in U.S. history, and now because of the international nature of this uh, in world history. It is nothing less than that, uh, but that means that each one of you can play a role in this. Uh, this webinar is emblematic of what Julian Assange wanted when he created WikiLeaks. He wanted people to be able to speak out, to speak truth to power, uh, to, to forthrightly and unabashedly condemn governments for what they are doing. Uh, little did he know that when he uh, unleashed this powerful vehicle, for information, for accountability, for transparency, uh, that he would fall victim uh, to the very powers that he was condemning. Um, I think it's very important that we realize that we have a human being, a husband, a father, uh, whose life is at stake here. Uh, we can lose track of that sometimes with these extraordinarily important issues of human rights and freedom of expression. Uh, but at the core of this is a human being uh, who should be enjoying the accolades of the international community, who already has been recognized by uh, journalism uh, organizations around the world. He should be enjoying this period of his life to continue to expose government wrongdoing, uh, and instead he wallows in this prison. Uh, that should call on every one of you. If you've heard something today that is new to you, if you've been moved by something you've heard today uh, about this assault on freedom of the press uh, and this persecution of Julian Assange, then support this movement. 
uh, make a contribution to the Julian Assange Defense Committee. Find an opportunity to come out at the next protest. Organize your own protests. Uh, there have been banner drops across the United States in small communities and large communities. We know that people can mobilize internationally when the issue is this important. So please spread the word, spread this webinar yourself, take action, uh, and then you will feel that you really are part of an international movement uh, that is so important and that you've played a part in it. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks, Marjorie. Really appreciate you all inaugurating our webinar series. I'm sure we'll invite each of you back uh, for further installments. So thank you so much. Thanks, of course, to Stella Assange and Ileana for working on this and putting it together. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for watching our first ever webinar. Um, right now, we're going to talk to you a little bit about an action that we would love you to do right now, if you can, while you're watching this. Um, and it is to call your reps to, to urge them to sign on to the House Resolution 934. So we put both of the links below. Um, the first one is a link so that you can find your rep if you don't know who your rep is. And then the other one is about the bill and uh, so you can read it and, and see how many co-sponsors are on it. Too little, spoiler alert, um, but also read what it's about. Um, so Nathan's actually going talk to talk about what it is just to introduce it. Go ahead, Nathan. Thanks, Eliana. So House Resolution is not and three, four, uh, expressing the sense of the House of Representatives that regular journalistic activities are protected under the First Amendment and that the United States ought to drop all charges against and attempts to extradite Julian Assange. So this is the clearest resolution we've had yet, uh, certainly since one that was introduced by, uh, I believe, Thomas Massey and Tulsi Gabbard a couple of years ago. This is the clearest language we've had yet calling for the outright uh, freedom of Julian Assange. Um, this was recently introduced late uh, in 2023 by Republican Paul Gosar. It has eight co-sponsors, uh, including a few other Republicans, as well as uh, Rep. Jim McGovern and uh, Ilhan Omar. Uh, so this is a bipartisan effort, but it needs a whole lot more co-sponsors uh, in order to be introduced for a vote in the House. Uh, so this is a, a really important uh, thing for you to do because we finally have something uh, for to ask our representatives to to jo join on to to sign on to. So uh, urge your representative right now to sign on to HR 934 and call for the freedom of Julian Assange. And we're going to put up a phone script here on the screen just in case you want to, you know, um use that it'll be a lot easier <laughs> i am very awkward so i don't like to just wing it but some of you might be really articulate and can do that so good on you but otherwise we're just we're just going to provide a phone script and we're also going to provide it on our websites just in case um you don't want to watch it on youtube for whatever reason um i do have a question nathan for the tulsi Gab gabbard and um what was the other name Miss massey Thomas Massey, Massey, Bill, what did they end up having at the end of their, when it closed? Uh, I don't have the, I don't remember the number offhand. It was um, similarly low and didn't end up getting introduced for a vote. So we need more co-sponsors this time, need to make it, uh, need to make it happen. Yeah, and this time I feel like there is enough momentum for something to happen. And it really comes down to us, like really the supporters and just really being a pain in the butt, I guess, really, <laughs> to get them to yeah, in the, do it. In the time since that resolution, we've had multiple letters from Congress members, uh, both on the Republican and Democratic side. We've had uh, new letters from press freedom groups, from publishers. Um, so I totally agree the momentum is, is in the right direction. Um, the political support is there. You know, I think these representatives can feel now that they're not going out on a limb that this is a mainstream position to defend the First Amendment and, and drop the charges against the challenge. Yes, absolutely. So everyone, please call your reps and thank you again so much. Um, 
Oh, and remember before we leave that we are, this webinar is ongoing, it's every month. And so we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear topic suggestions. We'd love to hear questions you have, um, all that good stuff. Pop, pop by our Instagram account at Stella Assange at Assange Defense and you know leave comments we read them and we will respond and you know we will get some really good speakers for the next one so thank you so much bye all right thanks for watching take care Dive into 2024 with the CPU's dynamic campaign, set to energize Quebec and Ontario by reaching 75,000 homes with our empowering message. Every contribution you make is pivotal, driving this ambitious initiative forward and ensuring our information lands directly in communities via Canada Post. We extend special thanks to our dedicated CPU members whose grassroots efforts amplify our reach. This campaign is your gateway to being part of a significant movement for change. Whether you choose to donate or volunteer, your participation is key to our success. Join us in making 2024 a victorious year for collective freedom and community action with the CPU.